Right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, it's a beautiful day out there. I know there's a lot of temptation to be outside <laughs> and get some sun. Um, so we appreciate you joining us. Um, we are recording this webinar. So if you feel that you'd like to go back and review or share it with someone um, who couldn't be here tonight live with us, that's going to be available. And I'll, I'll be sure to send that out to you all uh, tomorrow. Um, Caitlin Fellow, I'm the Association Director of Seneca Lake Pure Waters Association. Just trying to admit a few more people here. Um, and before I introduce our speaker tonight, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, as the warm weather approaches and we're looking at Seneca Lake, um, we have a lot of opportunities at Seneca Pure Waters to volunteer. Um, and be around the lake in, you know, a different way. And we obviously appreciate all the volunteers we currently have. We're always looking for more volunteers. Um, so I just tonight wanted to highlight a couple of the opportunities that we do have in the upcoming season, um, particularly related to invasive species. So we will um, continue our uh, macrophyte survey program, which is a uh, aquatic invasive species monitoring program that is actually run through the Finger Lakes Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. Um, they run out of the Finger Lakes Institute here in Geneva, and we partner with them to try and pull in as many volunteers as we can for Seneca Lake monitoring. Um, and, you know, all sorts of aquatic invasive species we're looking for, but certainly starry stonewort as well. Um, that's a really good opportunity for people. That program runs um, between June and September. We also are going to be doing a boat launch uh, landing blitz this year. We did start that program last year, and Seneca Pure Waters is going to be running it again this year. Uh, that uh, is just a few days of the summer. Um, on busy weekends, we go out to boat launches and we talk with boaters coming in and out of Seneca Lake um, about importance of the clean, drain, dry messaging um, and method to prevent invasive species uh, spread. And so we'll be doing that again this year, and we hope to have more volunteers, of course, continue to build that program. We are also going to be uh, partnering with a few different organizations in the watershed this year for a water chestnut pull. This will likely be a one-day opportunity. Um, We'll get out in their kayaks down at Hector Falls um, and they go in and they pull uh, water chestnuts. So that's kind of a fun one. Uh, more to come on that. That'll be in July. Finally, not related to uh, invasive species, we'll have another program um, or volunteer opportunity coming up on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we are partnering with the Finger Lakes Institute and SUNY ESF uh, with a for a fish study of Seneca Lake fish, uh, specifically trout, but other species as well. Um, we'll be collecting samples during the Lake Trout Derby uh, Memorial Day weekend. And so we're going to be looking for volunteers for that weekend as well. Any of these opportunities interest you uh, and many, many other opportunities, you can visit our website, SenecaLake.org slash volunteer. And I'll put that in the chat box and you can go directly there. Uh, you can sign up and you can look at a lot of different opportunities that we have for volunteering. And of course, we appreciate your time. So with that, I'll admit a few more people here. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, her name is Lexi Davis. Lexi is the natural resource and watershed educator for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Yates County. Um, she received her master's in environmental science and ecology from SUNY Brockport in 2022. And she had a focus on invasive species management and plant genetics. So this is really great to have her here tonight to talk to us about starry stonewort in Cuca and Seneca Lake. Thank you, Lexi. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, I hope you got to enjoy some of the beautiful weather today. And I just want to start by saying that I don't consider myself a starry stonework expert by any means, um, but I have done a lot of reading and searching since starting this position, um, and we still have a lot to learn. So I hope 
um, this is an opportunity for both of us um, to learn some things from each other. So um, the outline for the presentation is just answering some of these questions. So first, what is sorry stonewort? Where is it? How does it spread? What are the impacts? What are some different control options? What has the Cuba Lake Association or the KLA done um, to control sorry stonewort? And what can you do? Okay, so first, um, starry stonewort or SSW is a invasive species. So um, it is a non-native species that has negative impacts on the environment, the economy, and or um, humans. So it is a large green algae, a macro algae that can grow up to seven feet long. Um, so I hope you can see my mouse, but this entire length here is what we call a thallus. So a thallus is a plant body that has that is not differentiated into stem and leaves. So each thallus can grow up to seven feet long, and there's obviously lots and lots of these um, in a population of sorry stonewort. So this is submersed in lakes, ponds, and slow moving water bodies, and it can grow in depths of um, 30 feet or more. And it anchors to sediments um, with what are called rhizoids. So these are filamentous outgrowths or root hairs um, that are on the underside of these thalluses. So sorry stonewort can be a little bit hard to identify. Um, but its key distinguishing features are it has patterns of nodes and world branching. Um, so you'll see in um, this bottom picture here, these branchlets are what they call are called, um, summing off of the um, middle stem here. So all of those branchlets originate in a single location around the stem. So that's what we call world branching. And obviously it gets its name from these white star-shaped bulbils. So these are axillary buds on the stem that are in place of a flower. Um, so these are clones of the parent plant, and um, this is where a lot of the new plants come from. So sorry, stonewort does have a lot of look-alike species. Um, so um, some of these are um, native, some of them are invasive. Um, one of them is called brittle naiad or the water nymph. Um, this is an invasive species as well. Um, so it doesn't have as many branches or branchlets in a whorl as the starry stonewort does. So starry stonewort generally has um, greater than seven, usually like seven, eight, or nine, um, but the brittle naiad usually has less than less than six. And if you look closer, you'll see that um, the leaves of the brittle naiad are toothed. They are actually kind of sharp. Um, so that's a key difference um, between the brittle naiad and the starry stonewort. Another is um, leafy pondweed. Um, so leafy pondweed has three or more leaves per node. Um, so looking at these pictures, you're probably thinking, well, this doesn't really look like starry stonewort. Um, but when there's a lot of it, um, it can definitely look like it just because of its stringy nature. Um, and the, another key difference is this fleshy fruit that it has. So the sorry stonewort has these small round orange, they're called anthridia, um, but they don't have this bigger, large fleshy fruit like the leafy pondweed does. And if it isn't already complicated enough, we actually have native stoneworts. Um, so on the left, we have sorry stonewort, and on the right, we have a species of native stonewort. Um, so in the native stoneworts, the branchlets are in more of a cluster. So you'll see that there are lots of them in tiny clusters compared to these like large um, whorls. And in the um, native stone, stonewarts, there are obviously no bulbils in the white star um, morphology. Um, they have these darker round um, bulbils. So where is starry stonewort in the United States? So first, um, 
it is native to Eurasia. And actually in um, those countries, it is um, a, a threatened species. It's a very treasured species. So it just goes to show um, how dangerous a species can be outside of its native range. So it was first documented in the St. Lawrence River in 1978, and it was most likely introduced um, via ballast water. And it's currently known in 10 states spanning the Great Lakes, smaller lakes such as the Finger Lakes, and ponds. Um, so you can see this um, survey was conducted in 2016. So it is a little out of date, but thanks to the use of IMAP invasives, um, we can have a more updated map. So in New York State, it's um, present in a little bit over half of the state. Um, so there are populations in Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, in the St. Lawrence River, where it was first introduced, and in just about all of the Finger Lakes. So taking a closer look, you'll see that there are just a few of the Finger Lakes um, that don't have starry stonework in them. Um, so Cayuga Lake is packed with it, um, but um, you'll see that in this map, the darker and larger the orange circle, the more reports that there are. So if we zoom in on Cuca Lake, you'll see that there are over 600 reports of starry stonework on Cuca Lake. Um, so each report is indicated by these green dots, and a lot of them do overlap, um, but there was also a new population discovered in 2022 in the Brandy Bay area that was not inputted into IMAP, just that I know that because <laughs> I found it. Um, and this lake hasn't been surveyed specifically for invasive species since 2020 by um, the Finger Lakes Prism. Um, that's where most of these um, reports were um, inputted. Um, they have a early detection rapid response team um, that visited most of the Finger Lakes and did these, these surveys looking for invasives. So in Seneca Lake, there are over 500 reports of starry stonework, mostly in the northern end. Um, so I'll zoom in in the northern end just so you can kind of see. Um, most of these are surrounding um, this boat dock that you have here, um, which makes sense and we'll get to in a little bit. So how does starry stonewort spread? So the first option is through these bolos. So these are white star-shaped um, structures that are about the size of a grain of rice. They're, they're really small, they're kind of hard to see, um, and some of the thalluses don't actually have them. And they form on these like clear threads, um, almost looking like fishing line. Um, from the base of the plant, and this can be either above or below the sediment surface, which is important to consider um, when you're thinking about control options. And many new plants can come from this bulbo, so I don't have a source to back this up, but I've been told that each of these little bumps actually produces a whole new plant. So there are also male reproductive structures called anthridia. So these are the orange spheres at the tips of the branchlets that I was referring to. Um, however, in the North American morphotypes, so not the native, um, the North American morphotype that we have here, they are sterile, so they don't have the oocytes or um, just simply put reproductive structures. So this is not really a viable means of reproduction or spreading. So fragmentation seems to be the most frequent form of spread for starry stonewort. Um, it can spread from a fragment less than an inch in length. Um, so if it gets caught on boats, trailers, anchors, equipment, anything like that, and taken um, throughout the lake, um, it, can, it can spread from any form of um, fragment that is that is left there. Um, so it's often found um, adjacent to boat landings. So I overlaid a map of all of the 
most common marinas used over top of Cuca Lake. And as you can see, these heavily trafficked marinas is where you find most of the starry stonewort populations. So if you do the same for Seneca Lake, you'll see the same. So you have um, these populations near um, where these marinas are. So that's a good um, point to note that if you are wanting to look for where Sorry Stonewort might be, a good place to start is are these large marinas or boat docks. So the impacts of Sorry Stonewort, obviously it forms really dense growth mats. Um, like you see in this picture here. Um, so this severely impacts recreation. I don't know anyone that would want to swim through that. It gets caught on your legs. It's very gross um, and kind of dangerous, really. Um, so in terms of fish, it obviously reduces the cover. So it therefore reduces spawning um, and it reduces food sources as well. Um, for vegetation, with these um, large populations, there really is no chance for other species to grow amongst it, um, so that severely reduces biodiversity. So in this picture, you can see mainly starry stonewort, but on the very edges where it hasn't reached yet, you'll see some native aquatics like coontail and things like that, but um, not for long. So with this dense growth, obviously starry stonewort will, obvious, will impact the water quality. So it is known to absorb phosphorus, which is a, a good thing when you think of harmful algal blooms and things like that, um, which is why it's so treasured in its native range. Um, but when there's so much of it, it absorbs too much of the phosphorus. So there is a chemical change of the sediment. So there's reduced dissolved oxygen available due to the decomposition and therefore increased nutrient loading. So you're probably wondering, what do we do about it? What can we do about it? Um, so there are some different methods. Um, there aren't a lot of studies that go over the efficacy of these methods. These are just some of the options that are out there. Um, so the first is mechanical methods. So this can be hand pulling or mechanical harvesting. Um, but this um, has the potential to cause fragmentation, which again, like I said, makes it spread. And the other is diver assisted suction harvesting or DASH. It does not create fragments because it's essentially vacuuming up um, the entire thallus or plant. And it can be species selective, so you can um, absorb or vacuum up the species that you want to target. And if other natives are included in there, you can obviously throw them back into the water. So DASH is a little bit hard of a concept to understand. So I have just this quick little video um, that goes over how it works. Aquatic vegetation can grow out of control and ruin the beauty and health of your lake. Diver-assisted suction harvesting, or DASH, offered by ILM, allows for the selective removal of nuisance aquatic plants. The diver identifies the unwanted plants and feeds them into a vacuum hose, roots and all. The harvested plants are carried through the hose and captured, allowing the water back into the lake. Since the plants are physically uprooted, it's a long-lasting, chemical-free solution. Connect with us for a quick and safe solution. So another option that we haven't tried at the KLA is the use of benthic mats. Um, so these are essentially large, thick tarps that lay on the bottom of the lake um, on top of the targeted species that you're wanting to control. So these are very localized and they're fairly inexpensive when comparing to other forms of treatment. Um, so an example of some benthic mats being used for invasive species control is over on Skinny Atlas Lake. Um, they use it extensively for Eurasian water milfoil control. So they have locations along um, the shoreline where they 
um, put in lots of benthic mats. You'll see here like 325 of them. So that's definitely an option for controlling starry stonewort as well, especially since it grows um, in the shallower water. And another form of control is chemical use of algicide. Um, so these are typically copper-based. However, um, the long-term impacts of using the algicide are really unknown. And in laboratory studies, um, it's shown that it actually increases the production of those bulbils. Um, so there's potential for it to um, increase the biomass of starry stonewort despite um, trying to control it. So the best time to control starry stonewort um, growth usually starts in July. It does need those warmer water temperatures to grow. Um, so in this study, they monitored the growth of in biomass of starry stonewort throughout the year. So as you can see here in June, July, it really started to pick up and then tapers off when the lake water gets colder here in November and then dies back down into into um, the winter. Um, however, fish spawning occurs in New York State from mid-March through June, so you cannot disrupt the water until July 1st. Um, so that's an important piece when considering control efforts as well. So getting into what the Cuca Lake Association has done about starry stonewort. So much of this was done before the start of my position. Um, so I'm going to do the best I can about um, explaining everything um, that was done prior to my entry. Um, so in 2015, starry stonewort was first discovered in the Cuca outlet, um, actually by a watercraft steward. So that um, just goes to show how important it is for um, the use of that program and checking your boats when you're exiting the water. It was then discovered in Sugar Creek, which is over on the west arm. Um, it's a major inlet into Cuca Lake um, in Branchport. So it was discovered there in 2016. And then in 2020, it was discovered to have migrated or grown um, from Sugar Creek into the lake. So between 2017 and 2020, harvesting occurred one time per year in mid to late August. Um, using a mechanical harvester or hand pulling. And then in 2021 and 2022, we conducted the dash harvesting. So in 2021, we did the dash harvesting in August. And in 2022, we did it in July. So for the mechanical harvesting, the methods we used, we did the mechanical harvesting in the Cuca outlet in 2017 through 2019, again, again once per year. Um, so this mechanical harvester like that's shown in this picture is a machine that kind of floats on the top of the water um, and has a conveyor belt that pulls the starry stonework up and then it gets dropped into this holding tank and then the holding tank um, is emptied onto shore. And then in Sugar Creek, we did some hand pulling. So just using rakes and just collecting the biomass from kayaks or canoes, small boats. Um, and both of these methods are potentially spreading starry stonewort um, because it is creating fragments. And all of the biomass that was collected was composted at a local composting um, business. So for the results of the mechanical harvesting, um, the collection of biomass seemed to vary each year. Um, so as you can see in these pictures, the first year, that's a ton of biomass. Um, 2018, it seems to be less, and in 2019, um, a little bit more. So it really did vary depending on the each year. And um, we don't have a lot of data um, quantitative data that backs up how much biomass was being um, collected. Um, I know that in the future we're definitely going to try to use more quantitative methods um, so we can um, statistically show um, what methods are working. So 
the very few studies that there are about sorry somewhere control don't really recommend this method unless it's done multiple times throughout the year just so you're continually collecting the biomass and hopefully reducing um, the amount of fragments as you go back for each of them each time you use um, the harvester or hand pulling. And for DASH, we did this in the Western Arm um, in Branchport, and we had a focus on the North End Marina. So this is a heavily trafficked marina with large power boats. So we wanted to focus our efforts on this area because um, we were worried about the spread by these boats, you know, lowering into the water, um, picking up the starry stone wart off the dock, and then transporting it throughout the lake. So we contracted with ILM, or Integrated Lake Management Environments, to do this. Um, we took bids from the very few companies that there are that do this, and they seem to be the best option. Um, but there are other companies that do it as well. And we contracted on a per day basis and quantified the cubic meters of starry stonework that were removed. And again, the biomass was composted. So for the results in 2021, DASH was conducted in August. So it's important to note the timing. And we did three days of treatment we collected 135 bags of starry stonewort, which equated to about 22 and a half cubic meters. So you'll notice that the pre-dash and post-dash maps um, indicate the presence and absence of starry stonewort, and they are pretty much identical. So um, there wasn't necessarily an immediate um, gratification of doing DASH because starry stonewort was still present in the locations that we did them. However, we were obviously extracting biomass, so it was just in um, less of a degree of presence as it was um, before we did it. So we're definitely going to be working on different um, data collection tactics so we can better represent how well these control efforts are working. And in 2022, we conducted DASH in July, specifically July 11th through 16th. Um, we did six days of treatment this time, and we collected 43 bags of starry stonewort, which equates to 7.2 cubic meters. So I want to point out that we did a significantly larger area of DASH than we did in August in 2021, but obviously the amount of biomass that we collected was much, much less. Um, so the divers did report that there was less biomass in the areas that were previously treated, but this also could be due to timing of um, treatment. So um, if we go back to thinking about the graph that showed the starry stonework growth over time, there was ex exponential growth between July and August just because of the warmer waters. So um, we could have collected less just because there was less starry stonework in, at that time. So when comparing our pre-DASH surveys between 21 and 2022, you'll see that there was an elimination of starry stonewort in Sugar Creek, at least in the um, July time when we did the pre-DASH um, survey in 2022. However, there was additional um, populations in the marina. So it stayed pretty consistent um, with starry stonewort not um, venturing out along this sandbar here. Um, but again, we're not sure if this could be due to timing or the fact that we are actually really controlling um, the species. So our plans for 2023 for control are to continue the use of DASH. So we're going to do it um, July 10th through 15th this year. So 
um, we're going to have some consistency in the timing of treatment. So we'll be, a, be able to better compare um, how well these treatments are working. And we're also going to have some better data collection for pre and post treatment comparison. That way we can have some statistical analysis to kind of back up the efficacy of these treatments. We're also going to be um, putting some benthic mats in, in some areas. We haven't yet determined the specific locations. Um, and we are wanting to test kind of the timing of how long these mats need to be laid on top of the starry stone wart. Um, so we plan on purchasing a few mats and leaving some on for the entire summer and then moving the others around um, after four weeks or eight weeks um, just so we can see if those four or eight week timings are effective enough at um, eliminating starry stone wart. And I also want to mention that um, with invasive species management, um, elimination or complete eradication of the species is, is really difficult. Um, so it's really about controlling it the best that you can. Um, so for some other things that we're doing, we're going to be doing aquatic invasive species surveying throughout the whole lake um, to determine um, how much sorry stonework there is, as well as other aquatic invasives, and how much there is. Um, so this will give us a better idea of the um, different populations and density throughout Cuca Lake. And we're also um, going to be training our shoreline monitoring program volunteers how to identify sorry stonewort and add this as a question onto our regular survey that they use um, just so we can have more eyes to see if we can find where it is. So some things that you can do um, prevention is key when it comes to aquatic invasive species, so please be sure to educate the public and practice yourself um, clean, drain, dry. Um, so making sure that every time you exit a water body, you completely clean your boat, um, drain it, and dry it before entering a new water body or even the same water body. And utilize citizen scientists to look for where starry stonewort is. Um, you can also look into the use of benthic mats. I recommend this just because it can be a more localized treatment and it is fairly inexpensive compared to other forms of treatment that are out there. And also keep a, an eye out for more research um, just so we know um, what is being done scientifically that suggests the effective treatments. So in summary, Starry stonewort is an invasive macroalgae that is present in almost all of the Finger Lakes, especially around docks and marinas. It spreads possibly through bulbils, but mostly by fragmentation. It reduces the biodiversity, um, reduces the quality of fish habitat and water quality. Some control options are harvesting via mechanical means or dash, um, benthic mats, or algicide. The KLA has tried the mechanical harvesting through the mechanical harvester and hand pulling, as well as DASH, and we'll be utilizing benthic mats in 2023. So some things you can do are identify locations of where starry stonewort is and use specific localized treatments. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Lexi, thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat. I just have a couple sort of basic questions as far as identifying um, starry stonewort. Um, one is in regards to the star. So I know you said that very small, the size of a, a piece of rice even, are they present all growing season or is there only a certain time of year that, that those would be you know, present on the plant? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, so in my experience, I've definitely noticed more of them starting in August. I've seen a few in July, um, but definitely not many. And in um, June, even less. 
Um, so the longer the season goes throughout and the warmer the temperatures are, the longer it has to develop the more of these bulbils that you'll see. Okay. And I, I find the map that you shared about uh, Seneca Lake and the presence of starry stonework really interesting because the one that you highlighted um, the boat launch there is actually Hobart and William Smith boat launch and um, they don't have motorized well at least I don't believe they use motorized vehicles off of that dock um, it's a lot of sail it's a sailboat uh, house and so you know I wonder if they're like it seems pretty significant the amount of starry stonework that have been reported there um mm -hmm. I, I imagine these reports are coming over several years of collecting and monitoring. Um, mm -hmm. But I just find that interesting that, um, you know, it's not only motorized vehicle uh, boats that could collect and transport starry stonework. It's even, you know, boats like, like sailboats. So that I, I found pretty interesting. Right, absolutely. And it, it breaks off so easily. Like it reminds me of, when your Christmas tree is really old at the end of the year and you go to pick it up and like all the branches fall off like yeah. that's what it's like <laughs> so it sticks to everything even just like I said like an inch of a piece will just spread so gotcha um I and then one I just have one more question and then we'll go to the chat box um the benthic mats and I know that there's some interest in the benthic mats but I'm curious if using them for a season, you know, during the growing season and therefore suppressing the whatever plant where, you know, you're looking to suppress, does that actually kill off that species or is that really just a temporary solution for the benefit of uh, the swimmer or the, you know, the, the lake user? Right, definitely. Um, so it depends on the species. Um, I think what's really important is when you use the mats and it does die back the species that you immediately replace it with native aquatic plants or fish structures or something that way when it is uncovered there is less of a chance of it to invade again just because there's already something there ah uh, okay okay great thank you so the chat box let's see Um, oh, Maria just clarified, Maria Hudson from Cuco Lake Association, um, in 2021, we actually used the DASH method Monday through Saturday, so actually 5.5 days, so a little longer than I think what you had on your presentation, Lexi. Um, another, so Pat says, wouldn't it be effective to collect in July, even though there is less biomass because it would be better contained and not spread? Right. Yes, definitely. That's the idea of doing it earlier, just because you're eliminating the biomass. So there's less biomass starting. So there's less spread. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, and where can one buy benthic mats and are they effective for weed control in general? Um, yes, they are effective for weed control in general. Um, they are, there are different um, efficacies for different species. Um, I'm not sure of specific places you can purchase them around Seneca Lake, but I know that we um, got quotes from, I think it was called Blue Stream um, over in Canadagua. If you just Google benthic mats um, near me, um, there's a, a list of vendors. Okay. Uh, Mark Gibson says, mats can be easily made using PVC pipe as a frame and a tarp as the mat. Zip tie the mat to the frame, just weigh it down with cinder blocks or large rocks. Yes, it. definitely. Um, something that I've been told as a negative for benthic mats is that zebra mussels love them. <laughs> Mm. So they end up shredding the mat. So it's really important to um, layer a lot of tarps or make sure you're purchasing a really um, thick tarp. Mm. Okay, good point. Um, 
Pat, we get something that looks like green cotton candy on the surface near our dock, but it sounds like starry stonewort is different. Yeah, so starry stonewort um, is definitely submerged in the water. Um, you'll have to really pull it up to see, um, but it, it's very brittle. Um, it, it crunches when you um, hold it in your hand. Um, mm -hmm. So those are some key indicators to look out for. And you can always send me a picture <laughs> um, to my email address. I would be happy to help with identification because it is a little tough. Yeah, there are some other algaes, depending on the season, um, that are more of surface algae um, mm -hmm. that you may be seeing, Pat. Mm -hmm. And filamentous algae, too, the like hair, like stringy stuff, um, can often look like a dense population of starry stonewort as well. Um, Sarah asks, what is Hobart William Smith doing to help control since it does seem to be easily spread? Um, so I'm not sure. Um, I know um, in the past they had a Starry Stone Work Collaborative. Um, this was operating under a grant that unfortunately ran out, um, but you can access all their resources and the information that they put together um, on the Finger Lakes Institute or Finger Lakes PRISM website under the Starry Stone Work Collaborative. Yeah, I, I don't know if the collaborative is um, still going on either, but Fort William Smith and, um, you know, Finger Lakes Institute, which is housed at Hobart William Smith, they do run the macrophyte survey program. So actually, I think probably a lot of the data that Lexi has shared tonight is from Finger Lakes Prism, um, and that is housed within, within the Finger Lakes Institute, within Hobart William Smith. So, um, they do a lot of monitoring. I don't know that they're doing anything to manage Starry Stonewort at this time, but I can actually follow up, Sarah, um, to find out more because we're regularly in touch with the with the Finger Lakes Prism folks for, you know, in regards to Seneca Lake. Okay, David, many of my neighbors use weed cutters, rakes to remove weeds around their docks and then allow the weeds to float away. This distributes invasive species around the lake. Yes, yeah. definitely. Please don't do that. <laughs> Lexi, are a lot of invasive species spread by fragmentation? Yes, that seems to be a very common means of spread for invasive species. Um, probably the most dangerous and utilized. Okay, so education is key in that case, you know, because really all one needs to do is rake it up, let it dry out, use it for uh, composting or um, something like that rather than letting it float away. Okay, Bill, Wayne County Soil and Water has a nice educational article on their website. Okay, thanks, Bill. How much does DASH cost through the ILM or similar services? That's from Rich. Yeah, so it is quite an expensive um, management style. Um, so um, we equated it to be about $3,000 a day. Okay. Um, let's see, good questions. Oh, okay, Bill just clarified the Wayne County article is about benthic mats, if someone's interested in, in looking into that. Um, Maria from Cuca, the DEC does not require permits for smaller along the dock type mats, but larger mats such as used in skinny atlas would require a permit. Okay, that's good to know. Um, what is the general size, Lexi, of a benthic mat? I mean, what's the average? Mm, um, there are lots. Um, I think they're usually about uh, 20 feet by 20 feet. Okay. Okay, Connie says drying the mass of starry stonewort is sufficient to kill the bulb bulbils and fragments. Oh, yes. that's a question. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, yes, it is. After it is removed from the water for quite some time, it dries up very quickly and even is like 
dusty like it turns into like almost a dust um Mm -hmm. because it it needs that water it's a um obviously an aquatic macroalgae so without the ab with the absence of that water um it it doesn't survive (laughs) and Lexi you had said earlier that um you know starry stonewort is you know what's going to be found along the shoreline how deep can starry stonewort survive? Yeah, so um, there's been some discrepancy about this in um, the studies that I have seen, um, but I have found that it can grow up to about 30 feet in depth. Um, so that that's pretty deep um, considering. So there are, it might be present in areas that we just can't see. I think on the shoreline, it's it's really easy to see when there's a bunch of green stuff on the bottom, you know, so um, it might be present in some areas that we don't know about because of the mm-hmm. depth. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Rich asks, do any of the plant apps out there accurately identify starry stonewort? Yes. Um, so I personally use an app called Seek. Um, it is really good at identifying um, plants and even good at identifying aquatic plants, which is really difficult. (laughs) Um, So sometimes you do have to um, pull the the species up, but sometimes it can still do it um, while it's in the water. So um, the app is Seek, like looking for something, S-E-E-K. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to look for any other questions I had written down. We've reached the end of the questions in the chat box. If anybody wants to ask Lexi a question, you know, you're welcome to open up your microphone um, and ask if there's any final questions. I, I just want to say, Lexi, what a great job. Thank you so much for summarizing everything this way. Um, about the benthic mats, we've been wanting to do benthic maps for since the beginning when we started to decide what to do um, with starry stonewort in the Northwest branch. Um, and we actually put in a couple of um, grants, including benthic mats, but um, until this year, we haven't gotten funding for it. And Lexi found a way to get funding for it through some other way. <laughs> so, um, so I'm excited about that. And I, the reason that benthic mats might be a good option for homeowners is because just raking the stuff up and putting it on your shoreline, that still creates a lot of fragmentation. Whereas if you do put down the mat, at least along your dock, um, you are creating an environment for your kids or grandkids or whoever you are yourselves um, to have sort of a weed free as they want or want to call it environment without spreading um, any aquatic invasive species. And we have mm-hmm. others besides starry stonewort. Um, and they're, um, I, and again, I can't remember the name, but it, there's a place in Canandaigua you can get them. Um, Mrs. Wegmans is known as a famous uh, person who uses the benthic mats on Can- Canandaigua so that she can swim freely in her in her dock zone. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a really good alternative. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really glad that we're going to try it on Cuca. The DASH system, they come from, ILM comes all the way from Chicago. It's $3,000 $3, a day. I don't know if they want to continue coming to the Finger Lakes. We're so grateful they've come to Cuca and... Um, yeah, so they may expand and 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 come to everybody else, but um, that there is a a contract involved with them and um, housing, and uh, we need to feed them and that kind of stuff. So um, that's their labor, just to come to to Cuca, um, and we house them and we feed them. Um, I don't know what it would be if you know they had to come and stay in a hotel and you know, feed themselves and stuff like that. So they come for a week and they stay basically at my house and they, which is close to the site. We wish they would expand and we hope they will expand, but we'll see. 
So maybe if you guys, you know, start calling on them, maybe they'll expand their operations. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Maria. I, yeah, I'm really interested to see how the benthic mats work on Cuca Lake this summer, because I think, you know, Lexi, with what you covered tonight, you know, there's a, there's some options there for management, but unknown how successful those really are. And um, so I'm interested to see the results from this summer's effort. So you'll be using the benthic mats. Will you be doing any harvesting or, or using the, the divers? Are you doing all three of those methods this summer? How's that going to work? So we're definitely doing dash and the benthic mats, and we're still seeing about the harvesting. I hope so, because we'll be comparing all three of those at the same time um, in the same summer, which will be um, really good for statistical analyses. So I'm yeah. hoping so, um, but Great. we'll see. Great. Okay. Any other questions for Lexi? Lexi, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, again, this has been recorded and Lexi has offered to send her slides over to me. So I'll be sharing those as well. And um, really appreciate everybody's time. Enjoy the warm weather this week. I know it's going to dip down again, but we'll get there eventually, <laughs> permanently or semi-permanently. Um, so yeah, Lexi, thank you so much. Um, and we look forward to hearing more about Cuca Lake's efforts to manage Starry Stonework. Yeah, thank you for having me. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thank you.